Dr. Sonenberg, thank you so much again. Okay, so can um, people see my screen? Does that seem to be working? Yes, yes, yes. perfect, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to talk to you all today about some of the work that we're doing here at Stanford um, in our lab in microbiology and immunology. Um, we're interested in understanding the role of the bacteria that live within our gut, our gut microbiota or microbiome, and how we can use our understanding of the microbiome um, in order to improve human health. So I'm gonna talk about some of the questions that we're interested in answering within the lab. Um, one of them, why are gut bacteria so important? We hear so much about gut bacteria over the past few years. Um, and, there's, and it's because there's a lot of very interesting research coming out about the role of gut bacteria in human health. How does our gut microbiome influence our health? Why is it that all these bacteria that reside within our gut can have profound influences on systems outside the gut, like our respiratory or central nervous system. And finally, how can we use that powerful lever of the microbiome to influence our own health? What are the things that we've learned about lifestyle or dietary changes that can improve our microbiome and improve our health? So I wanted to start with a poll question. Um, Here we go. So which of the following statements is not true? Human genome is only a small percentage of the total genetic material we carry. The gut microbiome is sometimes referred to as the forgotten organ. There are more bacteria in your gut than pages on the internet. Or our gut secretes a mucus lining that allows bacteria to penetrate the intestinal wall. Okay, has everybody answered? Let's see, how do we get to? Not yet, we are waiting for the uh, more votes, but unless some people don't wanna answer, but I can end the polling and get the answers. Does everybody see the results? Yeah, so this looks very good. The correct answer was that our gut secretes a mucus lining to allow bacteria to penetrate the intestinal wall. Um, it's actually the opposite of that. And I'll show you this very um, vividly on the next slide. So we, this is a slide of, the, of a mouse, col cross section of a mouse colon. Um, on the top left, all these little jelly bean looking things, these are gut bacteria. And in the bottom right, this is the host intestinal cells. And you see this green smear across, um, that's the mucus lining that I was talking about in that poll question. And the mucus lining actually serves as a fence. So our intestinal cells secrete mucus to create this fence in order to keep gut bacteria within the um, interior of the intestine and the lumen of the gut and um, to protect our own cells from being invaded by these microbes. So this mucus lining, this intestinal sort of fence here is actually a very important barrier that we uh, put up in, in order to keep microbes in their proper place. And I'll talk more about this um, mucus lining a little bit later. We harbor trillions of microbes, so um, it's actually between 10 and 100 trillion microbes. And I looked up online the other day and there's about a trillion pages on the internet. So that's why we actually harbor more microbes than there are pages on the internet. Um, we have 100 times more genes in our microbial genome than in our human genome. So if you think of yourself as um, you know, a collection of DNA, we're actually only 1% human, 
99% of our associated genetic material is microbial in origin. So we're actually more microbial than human um, from a genetic standpoint. And what we've found over the past decade of research is that these microbes are wired into all aspects of our biology. So the metabolism and the different processes that take place within the gut aren't maintained within the confines of the gut. These metabolites can get into our bloodstream, circulate through our body and influence things as distal as our respiratory system, cardiovascular system. So why all the attention on the microbiota all of a sudden? Part of that came from an experiment that was done about a decade ago in which um, Jeff Gordon's lab at uh, Washington University in St. Louis did this experiment where he took, his lab took obese mice and took the microbiome of these obese mice and transplanted it into normal weight mice. Then these normal weight mice were treated normally. They ate same amount of food, um, exercised the same that they had before. So nothing changed other than receiving this obese microbiota. And what they found was that the mice that received the obese microbiota actually increased in body fat much more than the mice that hadn't received the obese microbiota. And what this experiment really vividly demonstrated was that the microbiota could actually dictate host physiology. It could cause obesity in this case. And after this um, paper was published, there was much more realization in the field that the microbiota truly was an important lever in host physiology and could be used to treat one of the um, biggest issues facing Western medicine right now, which is obesity and its comorbidities. Part of why there's been this explosion in microbiome research is the combination of technologies that have been developed in order to enable microbiome research. So here I have a picture of um, a our mouse facility in our lab. And the experiment that I talked about before, the obese microbiome transplant experiment is only possible if you can house mice in a way that completely controls their environment. Because there are microbes everywhere, we can't just have mice in cages out in the air because they could accumulate or be exposed to microbes that we don't have control over. So here you can see we have these bubbles um, that are tightly controlled with HEPA filters, um, air, and all the materials that go into this um, bubble are autoclave, so everything is sterile. And here we have a mouse cage within this bubble. And so we can carefully control the microbes that this mouse houses within its gut. And so in that obese microbiome transplant experiment, what they did was they took normal weight mice that didn't have a microbiome because they live in this bubble, they were entirely sterile. And then they can put in an obese microbiota and see how that obese microbiota influences the physiology of, of the mice. And these types of experiments have been going on now for several years where um, people have transplanted microbiomes from humans that are obese, humans with number, a uh, variety of diseases to see how many of those diseases we can transfer into mice just by transferring the microbiome. And it turns out that there are many such diseases where the phenotype transfers, things like um, autism is, a, is an example of a disease that you maybe wouldn't think could be transferred by microbes, but um, there have been experiments shows that have shown that that's the case. The other thing, um, technology that's been um, created and, and largely expanded recently is the use of anaerobic culturing. So one thing that has held back microbiome research historically is that most of the bacteria that live within our gut um, live, don't survive in the presence of oxygen. Our gut, our large intestine is largely an anaerobic or oxygen lacking environment. And so these bacteria really require a no oxygen environment to grow. So this is a bubble similar to the mouse bubble, only this, instead of keeping mice in here, 
we keep plates with uh, bacteria. And so here is me holding a, a bacterial plate where I'm growing microbes that are found within the human gut. And you can see from the sensor here that measures um, oxygen levels in parts per million, there's no oxygen in this environment. So this is not an environment that we or a mouse could live in, but it is an environment that's very hospitable for gut microbes. And because of these anaerobic culturing techniques, now we can grow these bacteria uh, quite well um, outside of the human gut or outside of a, an animal model gut and start to do experiments to understand what sort of conditions do they like to grow in, what sort of conditions are harmful to their growth. And we can really get a better understanding of the lifestyle and um, kind of particulars of these gut bacteria. The final technology that was really important for allowing us to take um, an accurate census of the gut is next generation sequencing technology. So these are sequencing technologies that have been developed in the past couple decades that allow for relatively quick and inexpensive sequencing of communities of microbes that can be found anywhere. So you can imagine taking samples from the oral uh, microbiome, uh, throat, gut, skin, then these samples can be subjected to this next generation sequencing, which basically can provide a list of all the bacteria that are found within that community. So this really opened up our eyes to the diversity of microbes that are found in this in these different environments, how the types of microbes found in the mouth are distinct from those found in the gut, and then also allowed us to understand my, the microbes that are found within the gut of healthy people versus people with different diseases or people living different lifestyles around the world. Um, and that really illuminated how differences in the types of microbes that we harbor within our gut could influence our physiology and our propensity for um, various diseases. So based on these technologies and all this research done over the past couple decades, we've come to understand that the intestinal microbiota is connected to many chronic diseases. We know that it's connected to metabolism and obesity. I showed you that experiment that was done um, on the uh, obese mouse transplant to the lean mouse. Um, and it, since then it's been connected to type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome. It's also wired into our immune system and has been connected to autoimmune diseases, various cancers, allergies, and asthma. And then very interestingly, it appears that the bacteria within our gut is also connected to our brain, our behavior, and perhaps even aspects of our personality. Depression, autism, spectrum disorders, and multiple sclerosis have all been tied to the microbiome. And in an interesting set of experiments that was done in um, mouse models in those notobiotic isolators that I showed earlier, um, they were able to take mice, different breed uh, strains of mice that had different sort of personalities, different aversions to new stimulus that they would put in their cages and found that if they transplanted the microbes of say a more cagey mouse into a mouse that was um, less nervous, that they could actually make those mice more nervous just by transplanting the microbes. And that's where this idea that the microbiome uh, perhaps could influence things like our, our personality or some of our behaviors. So the microbiome has been connected to many of these chronic diseases, and we know that chronic diseases are on the rise. Um, especially within the industrialized world, but also globally as um, other parts of the world um, industrialize. So we know that incidents of autoimmune disorders or immune disorders are rising quite rapidly over the past couple decades. Um, adult obesity prevalence is actually rising quite quickly, not only within the U.S., but globally. The other thing that this graph doesn't show is that for many of these diseases, the age of onset is also getting much younger. Um, so autoimmune diseases are also becoming more common in children. 
And then uh, childhood obesity is becoming a growing problem um, in the US and globally. If we look at the global uh, burden of disease, the majority of that is from these non-communicable chronic diseases, um, things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory diseases, and diabetes. Um, and, and these diseases are um, not only becoming more prevalent within the industrialized world, but also growing globally as well. And the World Economic Forum came out with this statistic that chronic diseases could cost the global economy up to $47 trillion. So it's not just um, a health and medical issue, but is also an economic issue that is becoming global. So this is our view of chronic diseases. We know that these diseases are rising, especially in the West. And the way that medicine um, treats many of these chronic diseases because we don't understand a lot of the root causes of them is just by trimming branches. In other words, treating symptoms of chronic diseases and not really getting at the underlying conditions that are causing these diseases or causing the rise in these diseases. And it reminded me of this cartoon that I saw a while back. Here is a ship sinking and it says, great news captain, you can inform the passengers that we have slowed the rate of sinking. And in many ways, treating these chronic diseases by treating symptoms isn't really solving the problem. It's sort of slowing the rate of sinking. And so the question is, can we get to the root causes of these rises in chronic diseases? Are there many different causes for why we see this um, increase? Or are there a few causes that can explain most of the increases that we can target? There are a number of possibilities for um, what could be driving this increase in chronic disease. Uh, we know that these diseases are associated with industrialized Western populations. And we know that these populations have diets that are not typical of our um, evolutionary past. We have an increase in sedentary lifestyle, um, different chemicals that are now a part of our uh, food and environment, increased use of antibiotics, and um, exceptional hygiene. So we wondered, is there a unifying theory that could explain the rise in chronic disease? One hypothesis that we have in the lab is that problems with the microbiota could be a unifying cause or contributor to some of these chronic diseases. And if that's the case, then unlike our human genome, which we are stuck with the collection of genes that we uh, received upon conception, our microbiome is actually quite malleable. So depending on things like diet, medical practices, lifestyle choices, we can actually influence our microbiome and therefore potentially influence our human biology. So remember that I said at the beginning, only 1% of our associated genetic material is actually human in origin. 99% of our associated genetic material comes from our microbiome. And so if you think of the microbiome genetic material as malleable, something that we can change, that's very powerful to think that 99% of our associated genetic material is something that we have control over. We're not just stuck with the uh, microbes that we received at birth. Eric, there are many challenges. Uh, a couple of, uh, sorry, Eric, a couple no, no of questions are coming in. Would you like to answer them as we go or you would like to save them to the end? No, wh why don't we go ahead and answer them? Sure. Yeah. Well, the, the one question is, how does NGS find bacteria that have never been found or identified before? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the way that next generation sequencing works for microbiome analysis is we amplify regions of the bacterial genome that are highly conserved among all microbes. So this is that 16S ribosomal RNA sequences. And there are regions within that that are highly conserved across microbes, not just in the gut, but you know everywhere on the planet. And once we receive these sequences, then we do um, homology searches to known microbes. So there will be many microbes that um, align perfectly with microbes that have been identified previously, 
but there are, um, and depending on the community that you're looking at. So for example, if you're looking at the gut microbiome of a population of humans that's not been studied very carefully, and, and one that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later this morning, the hunter-gatherers, for example, many of the microbes that we see in their gut have never been um, isolated or sequenced before. And so often in these next generation sequencing experiments, we identify new microbes that have never been identified before. And we can try to get some understanding of what those microbes are like based on homology to other known microbes. So we can say, okay, we've never seen this microbe before, but it's actually like quite similar to another bacteria um, that we know a lot about. So we can try to guess like, okay, this microbe is probably doing this because it's so similar to this other bacteria that we know about. Sometimes there are microbes that we sequence um, that are really unlike anything we've seen before. And those are very interesting to us. Um, but the, it is more of a black box of, okay, there's this microbe we've identified in this person's gut. We've never really seen it before. We don't really know what it does. Um, and so we need to um, either try to isolate that bacteria from that person's microbiome or do additional sequencing in order to see the whole genome of that, of that particular microbe to understand what that bacteria is doing. But um, depending on the population that we're querying, sometimes there can be you know, 30, 40% of the bacteria within that person's gut that we really don't know that much about. So that's a great question. Thank you, wonderful. The next question uh, is, uh, if you transfer microbiota from calm mice into nervous mice, do the nervous mice become more calm? Yeah, so I'm, you know, those experiments have been done many different ways. And often it works in both directions. Um, sometimes the transfer of the personality isn't 100%. So the nervous mouse might be calmer than it was before, but not as calm as the original mouse was. Um, the way that these experiments are done, um, the transplant usually occurs in an adult mouse. And we think because the microbiome um, we accumulate in our infancy, that um, having microbes there from the beginning might push our physiology in a way that um, isn't the same as receiving those microbes as an adult. And so that's um, some of the things that we're also trying to understand in the lab is how important are, is it to have certain microbes at the beginning of life versus can you just supplement cer certain microbes later in life and still see the same beneficial effect? Thank you. Yeah. So um, I will uh, continue interrupting you. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, questions That's... come in. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, um, you know, there are challenges that we face in using the microbiome as a therapeutic target. One is each person's microbiota is unique. So um, each one of us has a collection of microbes that's slightly different from someone else. It's more similar to a family member or someone that we're living with than somebody across the street. Um, and then it's even more different if we live a completely different lifestyle. So somebody living on the other side of the world that um, is a hunter gatherer, for example. And that just makes the microbiota as a therapeutic target a little bit of a challenge because it's probably not going to be a one size fits all solution. And depending on your starting microbiota, therapeutics um, will likely need to be targeted specifically to your unique makeup of microbes that you carry within your gut. The microbiota is also incredibly complex. Like I said, there are 10 to 100 trillion microbes that just live within your gut, hundreds of different species. Um, many of these species, like the question before, we, we don't really know much about. And so there's a lot of basic knowledge that we still need to, to get in order to use the microbiota as a, a therapeutic target. And then finally, FDA regulations are an issue when you think about using a live microbe as a therapeutic. Um, most drugs within the United States are chemicals, small molecules that we can dose um, in a very 
controlled manner. Um, if the medication is causing problems, we can remove it so that those chemicals are no longer, um, that person's no longer taking them. If you think about giving a bacteria, um, because these things are alive and replicate, it's dosing can be quite difficult. So you give somebody, you know, a, a million of a certain microbe and depending on the state of that person's gut, that microbe could become a large portion of that person's microbiota. And we don't really have control over, you know, how much of that, how much that microbe replicates. And if there are issues with that microbe now entering someone's gut and causing adverse side effects, it's not so obvious how you could um, strategically remove that microbiome or that, that particular microbe. So um, tools will need to be developed in order to use bacteria as drugs. Um, but these are things that we and other groups are working on. So I, I think all of these things are challenges, but none of these things I think are gonna be insurmountable. Okay, how does our microbiome influence our health? Okay, I'm ready for poll question number two. Sorry, um, yeah, having technical difficulty. Um, okay. Okay, which of the following statements is not true? Our human genome um, is only a small percentage of the total genetic material that we carry. Oh wait, was this the first? I think this was the first poll question. Oh, um, okay, then give me a second. It seems uh, uh, I shared the same thing again. Yes, we, um, okay, let's end this one. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. My, okay, there you go. Okay, perfect. How do we get colonized by bacteria? All of our gut bacteria are acquired in the womb before birth. Our gut bacteria come from our mother, people we contact in our environment largely after we are born or acquiring gut bacteria is a slow process that takes decades. Could go ahead and end polling. Um, yeah, there are the results. Okay, great. So you guys mostly got the right answer. Our gut bacteria mostly come from um, our mother, people we contact, and our environment largely after we are born. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and whoops. So. Our microbial world colonizes our body at birth. There's some evidence that there might be a little bit of microbial exposure um, within the womb, um, but that's debatable. And, and if there are microbial exposures within the womb, they're actually quite small. Most of the gut bacteria um, that we acquire happens after we are born. It's different if we are born by C-section versus vaginal vaginally delivered, and it's different if we are um, formula fed versus breastfed, and um, a, a number of other sort of lifestyle changes uh, can influence that too. Whether you have a pet as an infant or not can also influence the types of bacteria that colonize you at birth. We also get microbes from our family members and environment. Your microbiome looks more like your family members and people you live with, um, and then a little bit less um, like people you work with or have contact with, and then even less so of people that live on the other side of the world. <laughs> 
And there's evidence that there's been vertical transmission of these microbes for millions of years. So many of the microbes that we are harboring within our gut have been a part of our evolutionary past since you know we became humans. And some of these microbes um, have actually been a part of our lineage um, since we were um, even further back in our evolutionary tree when we were um, had a common ancestor with our other great ape uh, cousins. And so these microbes have been a part of our, um, our bodies, our physiology for millions of years, which has allowed them plenty of time to integrate uh, within our biology and have likely co-evolved with our human genome. Okay, okay let's... questions came in. Um, okay, perfect. Um, uh, given that therapeutics uh, won't be uh, one size fits all and more specialized to each person, do you think these types of therapeutics will be affordable and accessible to everyone? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I sort of think about microbiota targeted therapies in like two buckets. I think that, um, and as you will see from my talk moving forward, I think there has been sort of a general disruption that's occurred to the human microbiome as humans have industrialized. And I think that the ways of fixing that um, can actually be quite generalizable. So we, we may not need to understand the exact specifics of each person's microbiome to deal with a lot of the chronic diseases that we see rising so quickly in the West. I think there will be issues, diseases, and other um, health issues that are more a result of individualized changes to the microbiome. And the question is um, how to get to therapeutics for those much quicker um, and, and relatively inexpensively. And that, that may be more of a challenge. We're finding as sequencing costs just keep declining, um, getting your microbiome typed in a way or to determine which type of bacteria that you have in your gut, I think is going to just be getting um, cheaper and cheaper. And then we're starting to institute some machine learning um, ways of, of taking this complex information and trying to narrow in on the most important parts that are uh, potentially propagating disease. And so hopefully these will allow for um, quicker and more inexpensive ways of, of treating um, diseases. The, you know, one example uh, that I would give about a microbiota ter targeted therapeutic that's actually um, quite crude and quite inexpensive that you guys may have heard of is this fecal microbiota transplants or FMT. And these are for people that have um, chronic C. difficile associated colitis. They've been treated with antibiotics. Their colitis is not getting better. And so um, it, as a, a final treatment, they just take feces from a healthy donor and then um, give them as a transplant to these people suffering from um, the C. difficile associated colitis. And the cure rate on that is actually quite high. It's I think above, you know, 90%. It's basically like, you know, as good of a cure rate as you can hope for. And there's an example of a, of a therapeutic that is quite crude, doesn't really rely on understanding the sick person's specific microbiota. It seems to be generalizable across um, a large patient cohort. And so I, I think there may be a lot of microbiota targeted therapies that are similar to FMT and that they're relatively easy, relatively inexpensive and, and generalizable. Um, so I have a lot of hope for that in the future. Thank you. Another question is, is there any live microbiome approved currently so beneficial effects can be realized? And are there any so many OTC formulations? Um, are, are the OTC formulations any good or waste of money? So the, this is for, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning first part of that um, question. This is like talking about probiotics, like? Uh, live microbiome approved uh, so the beneficial effects can be realized. 
Lot. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, you know, right now, the only thing that I think that is approved is the FMT that I talked about as far as giving live microbes. Um, there are, I think, some probiotic formulations that are um, a prescription only that are that have some clinical studies for efficacy. And then there's the whole slew of supplements that you can buy off the shelf of you know, various microbes, probiotic organisms, um, of which there is some promising data, some data not so great. And actually, I'm um, later on in my talk, I'm going to talk about microbes both found in fermented food and then also in um, probiotics and their effect in a human clinical trial that we ran. So um, I think there'll be a, a better answer to that coming in a, in a few minutes. And then the second part of that question was, um, are uh, the OTC formulations any good or, or waste of money? Yeah, so the, is that like, so over the counter, I, I would say, you know, that's like the supplement uh, probiotic stuff. And um, the, the studies on those are not um, amazing, mostly because they tend to be small cohorts of people um, and because of this whole microbiome being individualized, it probably benefits some people and not others. But when you run the statistics, the you know cohort wide, it's usually not a huge effect. Um, there's been a lot of issues with high quality probiotic studies that have been done. At, although that I would feel like I would say that that is changing, and that the probiotic industry is starting to do. Um, better clinical trials and, and fun studies to understand the efficacy of these over-the-counter uh, microbe formulations. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on too. Yeah, I think the next question also, you're gonna talk about it later on. Okay. It's about how dangerous it is to drink kombucha. kombucha. Oh yeah, so yeah, I'll hold off so on I that I think one. you're gonna yeah. talk about it. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that very soon. <laughs> okay, we will save that question for that part. Thank you. Okay, so the, um, just to understand exactly what the microbiome is doing in the gut, um, most of, you know, our entire digestive system is colonized by microbes, but most of those microbes live within the colon or large intestine. So that's um, where the majority of the microbiota lives. And when you eat a diet that's rich in these complex carbohydrates or dietary fiber, these complex carbohydrates our human genome is actually quite poor at degrading these. We just don't have the genetic capacity to generate the enzymes required to break down these complex carbohydrates. So these complex carbohydrates reach the large intestine intact. And that's where the microbes that actually contain a huge number of genes, 60 to 100,000 genes to degrade this dietary fiber, they can ferment these complex carbohydrates when they do that, they release small molecules, these microbiota metabolites, some of them um, actually look quite drug-like. Those metabolites can then enter our circulation, circulate throughout our body. And this is the mechanism by which we think that bacteria in the gut can influence our health systemically. So this is just a small um, sort of a small number of the, sm of the molecules that we've identified within the circulation of humans that we know are derived from the microbiota. And this is actually a very small number. We've, identif we've seen hundreds to thousands of these small molecules circulating in humans that have a microbial origin. So these microbes within the gut, um, we like to think of them in a way as like sort of unsupervised drug factories. They are creating these small molecules. Many of them are, look very drug-like, and this is how they're influencing our biology. Now we know that the typical Western or American diet isn't so high in complex carbohydrates. Most of the carbohydrates that we consume in the Western world is in the form of simple carbohydrates. So things like sucrose, fructose, starch. These are simple carbohydrates that are found in pastries or white rice and white bread and uh, white pasta. And these simple carbohydrates, 
unlike the complex carbohydrates, the human genome is actually quite good at degrading these. So these get degraded early in our digestion in our small intestine. These um, get cleaved into their monosaccharide components and they enter our circulation. And this is where we get that boost in uh, blood sugar levels after we have a very uh, a meal that's very high in sucrose or starch or these other simple carbohydrates. And the problem with this is that, you know, it raises blood glucose. It, it over long periods of time can result in insulin insensitivity. This is the rise in type two diabetes that we see happening um, within the United States. And the other problem is that um, it, because this is so, these simple carbohydrates are so efficiently um, extracted by um, our circulation early in digestion, it sort of leaves these microbes here without anything to eat, right? So there, there's no carbohydrates making it to the large intestine in this like chocolate cake scenario. And what we find is that when the microbes aren't provided dietary fiber from a food source, they are forced to rely on the only carbohydrate source that's left within the colon. And that's within that mucus lining that I showed you, that green mucus lining. So that mucus is actually made up of complex carbohydrates. And it appears that the gut bacteria in the absence of food derived complex carbohydrates actually eats that mucus layer. And we saw this very vividly in an experiment we did where we took mice, we fed them either a fiber rich diet or a fiber deficient diet. We didn't actually feed mice donuts and soda. This is just like a representation of, of the nutritional component of the diet that we gave them. And what we found was the mice eating the fiber rich diet had this beautiful thick mucus lining. All the microbes here are sort of maintained at a nice safe distance from the intestinal wall, but in the fiber deficient mice, we saw a thinning of this mucus lining. We saw a bloom of bacteria that are capable of degrading this mucus lining. And we also saw increased markers of inflammation within the mouse, which was an indication that the mouse was sensing that this mucus lining was thinning, that these bacteria were getting dangerously close to their intestinal wall, and so started setting off alarm bells within their immune system by raising inflammation in order to fight off a potential invasion by these microbes. So this fiber deficient diet was actually quite detrimental to these uh, mice. And this all makes sense with data that we know about dietary fiber and health. This is just a one study where they looked at 17 prospective studies, about a million people, uh, they had about 76,000 deaths and found that there was a 10% reduction in risk for each 10 grams per day increase in dietary fiber intake. And so dietary fiber, the amount of dietary fiber that these people um, was consuming was linked to um, their mortality. So low dietary fiber, increase the risk of all-cause mortality. And what we know is that the human diet has shifted from one that was traditionally high in fiber to low in fiber. So for the majority of our time as a species on this planet, we were hunter-gatherers. This is the way that all humans obtained food up until farming was invented somewhere around 10 to 20,000 years ago. And what we know from people that live on the planet today that are still hunting and gathering is they eat about 100 to 150 grams of dietary fiber per day. So we think that historically, this is what humans were consuming uh, when we were all hunters and gatherers. Uh, like I said, about 10,000 years ago is when agriculture was invented. And when we, we look at populations that live a lifestyle and eat a diet similar to our early agrarian ancestors, they're getting somewhere on the order of 35 to 50 grams of dietary fiber per day. And then in the past 100 years or so, the industrialized world has shifted towards a diet that's highly processed and sanitized. And we know that, um, for example, the average American is consuming only about 15 grams of dietary fiber per day. So that's about 10 times less um, of dietary fiber that we were consuming 
that we're consuming now compared to, uh, you know, our, our hunter gatherer ancestors. And when you think about dietary fibers, really the food that our gut bacteria relies on, um, that's actually uh, quite scary. The, how little dietary fiber that we're, we're giving them and has implications for the thinning of our mucus lining and um, increased levels of inflammation that we might be having as a result of this diet. And we know that um, in general, Western populations have higher levels of, of chronic inflammation than these traditional populations do. We wanted to understand what the microbiome of um, our hunter-gatherer ancestors look like. Since the majority of our time on our planet, this is how all people obtain food, we really feel like looking at the microbiome of hunter-gatherers is gonna give us the best view of what a healthy microbiome looks like because this is the longest period of time that the microbes and the human genome have had to co-evolve. So we study this group of individuals in Tanzania called the Hadza. They're one of the few remaining hunter-gatherer groups um, that are still practicing this lifestyle today. And they're doing it in Tanzania in the sort of cradle of human evolution. And so we think that, um, you know, while these people are fully modern, they have cell phones, they're very aware of global politics and um, those kinds of things, they do practice a lifestyle that is um, quite similar to our uh, our ancestors. And here you, you can see they're, uh, they've started this fire and they're cooking tubers. Here's a tuber right here. It actually looks like a stick, but it's a, a wild tuber that they consume. Um, this is their staple food. They're eating these tubers essentially every day. And from this picture inset here, you can see it's, um, it's kind of like a wild potato, only it looks nothing like, you know, the potatoes that we would get, say, at McDonald's. It's actually quite fibrous, so fibrous, in fact, that these people chew on these tubers. Um, they end up with this like fibrous mass at the end that they can't even swallow. Um, so that and they so they end up spitting out um, what they can't swallow. But the tubers is one of the reasons why these individuals are eating between 100 and 150 grams of dietary fiber per day. If we look at the microbiome of the Hadza of Tanzania. Um, we have them here compared to a group of individuals that are living a lifestyle similar to our early agrarian ancestors when farming was invented, and then also compared to um, Americans. The black here shows um, an individual species of microbe that we were able to um, observe within their gut. And then the red, yellow, and green just shows how abundant that microbe is. So if it's red, that means they had a lot of that particular species. If it's green, they had less so. And what we found was that um, within the Americans, there were this whole group of bacteria species that were missing that are um, quite prevalent and abundant in the Tanzanian hunter-gatherers and also um, quite prevalent and abundant in these early agrarians. And just in general from not only our group but other groups that study traditional populations around the globe, so these are populations also in, in South America and Papua New Guinea, we see this general trend of Western microbiomes just having less species in their gut. Our microbiome is less diverse than the microbiome of individuals living a traditional lifestyle. And we know that a low diversity microbiota is associated with poor health. This was a study that came out um, seven years ago where they took um, a group of Europeans and found that there was a group of them that had low, low diversity microbiota and another group that had a higher diversity microbiota. And what they found was the group with the lower diversity microbiota had increased adiposity, increased cholesterol, inflammation, higher insulin resistance, increased triglycerides, basically all bad news for the um, low diversity microbiota. There is a question, um, what is the effect of soluble or uh, insoluble dietary fiber? Which one is better for microbiome? So soluble and insoluble dietary fiber is a chemical designation of dietary fiber, not a designation that's meaningful to the microbiota. So um, 
some types of dietary fiber. So for example, um, cellulose, which is common in um, like, um, like, you know, paper or those kinds of things are not digestible by the microbiota. So those, those foods that have a high cellulose concentration, um, those are not going to get digested by the gut bacteria, um, but they do provide like a bulking um, effect on the stool and also increased motility. The, the, the types of carbohydrates that the gut bacteria can ferment fall into both categories of soluble versus and insoluble fiber. So just looking at that label doesn't really tell you um, whether there's a lot of stuff for the microbiota versus not. And so in general, I just tend to look at the overall dietary fiber number. Um, and that's just, I think, probably the best indication of uh, providing complex carbohydrates, some of which your microbiota can ferment, some of which you can't. Um, but there's just really no easy way to look at insoluble versus soluble fiber and figure that out. Thank you. Um, so I showed you that these traditional populations have a lower diversity microbiota than Western populations, um, but they also have a different composition. So not only do they have more different types of species, but they have species in, the micro in their microbiota that we just don't see in Western populations. So here are um, various populations around the world. The traditional populations are this first half, and then the industrialized populations here started Italy and down. And this graph just is an indication of how similar your microbiota is to somebody else. And what we find is that the traditional population microbiota are all pretty similar to one another. So these are people living in Africa, people living in South America. The types of bacteria they have in their gut is actually quite similar to one another and very different from that that we see in these industrialized populations. So it appears that not only have we lost species of microbes, we've changed the types of microbes that inhabit our gut. What does this look like in general? Um, I look you know, part of my job is to look at human microbiotas and animal model microbiotas. And so, you know, I, when I look at these compositions and I look at traditional populations, what I see is an ecosystem that's actually quite diverse, quite lush, um, and, and um, it just appears to be better functioning. When I look at microbiotas of individuals in the industrialized world, what it looks like to me is more of this sort of clear cut forest, missing species, um, much simpler composition. And there are many reasons why this could be happening, diet, antibiotics, all these things that are part of um, living in the industrialized world. And, and we think that all of these things are important, that all of these things have had their impact on the microbiota and cumulatively they've resulted in the community that we all harbor in the West right now. But we wanted to understand specifically the role of diet. And we did this um, in a mouse model in which we looked at mice that had a human microbiota. So these are mice that live in that bubble that I showed you earlier so we can control the microbiota that they house. And um, we fed these mice a low fiber diet and we fed them that low fiber diet for four generations to see what would happen to the microbiota over time. And then we also had a control group of mice that we just kept on a high fiber, sort of the normal mouse chow for four generations. And so here's the data from that study that we did. Um, each uh, row here is an individual mouse and each square, each column is a species of microbe that we see within their gut. So here we had five, um, five mice in the study and on the first generation, here's all the microbes they had in their gut, all these little squares. And you see over four generations, they largely maintain their um, microbiota diversity over the four generations. Remember these mice live in bubbles, so they can only lose microbes. They're not exposed to any sort of environmental microbes, so they can't gain in this experiment. 
Um, so what happened to the mice that we fed the low fiber diet to for four generations? What we saw was the stark loss of diversity over the time of the experiment. So here's the initial um, collection of microbes that these mice had at the top. And if you see by the fourth generation, they've lost about two thirds of the species within their gut. So just four generations on this low fiber diet was really very detrimental to their microbiome. In this fourth generation, we tried to put them back on a high fiber diet, but we were not able to see a, um, any sort of regain in, in microbiota diversity. So we think by the fourth generation, these species that were present um, in the first generation were truly extinct. They had just lost them over these four generations. And we think that something similar to that is what's happening um, in the industrialized world. So this was a, a paper that came out about four years ago showing that diet alone was capable of inducing extinctions in the gut microbiota that were not repairable by diet only. We actually took those fourth generation mice and gave them a fecal transplant from these high fiber mice. And that was actually um, able to restore the diversity that they had lost. So they needed a deliberate reintroduction of species in order to gain their, their diversity. So we think what our model for what's happened is that humans, when we were hunter-gatherers, harbored a microbiota that was very diverse, lots of different species. And then every time we've changed the way that we consume or, or um, acquire food, that, that the microbiota has had to adjust to that. And this adjustment has resulted in an overall loss in microbial diversity and a shift in the type of species that we see within the gut. And the question is, how do we bring the microbiota back to something that we think is more in line with our evolutionary past? Does diet change? Is that able to do it? Or are we gonna also have to reintroduce species like we did in our mouse experiment? Okay, how can we influence our microbiome to improve health? Our lab traditionally has done a lot of mouse work and mouse work is great because at the end of the experiment, you can sacrifice the mouse and really understand what's happened um, in that experiment. However, you know, mice are not humans and we were concerned that by studying mice, we would end up with this amazing understanding of the mouse microbiome, but maybe a lot of that wouldn't be translatable to humans. And in order to get to human relevant treatments faster, we thought, let's start um, studying humans. So many of the things that we think influence the microbiome are safe components of diets. But there's no reason that we can't start um, using humans as a model system to understand how diet can influence changes in the microbiome. And we know that the microbiota has been influenced by the Western diet. And um, we think that this influence has not been a positive one for our overall health. Okay, so the first study I'm gonna talk about, this was a clinical trial that we ran in collaboration with Christopher Gardner's group here at Stanford. And we asked the question, does a high fiber diet affect the human microbiome and their immune system? We enrolled 18 healthy adults. Um, we, we instructed them on how to increase their dietary fiber slowly. So we took baseline samples before any intervention. Over four weeks, they slowly increased the amount of high fiber foods they ate. And then for six weeks after that, we had them eat as much high fiber foods as possible. And then there was a four week choice period where participants could maintain their high fiber diet, go back to their prior diet, or do something in between, it was their choice. We told these participants to get the high fiber through foods only. So these participants did not take any sort of fiber supplements or, or prebiotic supplements, anything like that. We did dietary assessments throughout the study. And then we also did microbiome and immune system analysis in collaboration um, with uh, the Human Immune Monitoring Corps at Stanford and Mark Davis's group. 
We found that these participants were amazing in increasing their fiber intake. So on average, at the beginning of the study, they were eating only about 20 grams of dietary fiber per day. At the peak of their fiber consumption, they were eating well over 40 grams of dietary fiber per day. So they effectively doubled their intake of dietary fiber. And then in the choice phase, it turned out that most participants sort of landed somewhere in between their highest dietary fiber and their baseline. Um, participants could eat whatever high fiber foods they wanted. And so um, this provided a lot of flexibility for participants, but is in a way confounds our analysis a little bit in that some participants chose to eat a lot of legumes. Some participants decided they were gonna get most of their fiber through fruits and vegetables. Others really focused on things like grains and seeds. Um, so we, we weren't able to address whether certain types of high fiber foods um, were more beneficial than others, but it did allow us to just ask this general question of, if you eat a diet rich in high fiber foods, doesn't matter what types of foods you're eating, how does that change your microbiome and your health? I just wanna show you an example of one participant and how their diet shifted. Remember the only instructions we gave these people was um, eat as much dietary fiber as you can. We told them, we didn't say anything about calorie counting or um, eating less meat or saturated fat, none of that stuff. Just eat as much dietary fiber as you can. So this participant at baseline before the study was eating, a, I would say fairly typical American diet, a lot of packaged foods, frozen foods, takeout, that kind of thing. You know, not what we would view as, you know, a, a healthy diet or one that would support a healthy microbiome. In the high fiber phase, the same participant had radically changed their diet to one that was um, not only higher in fiber, but had more um, fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, less packaged food, um, and less takeout. So um, one thing that we found, which was very interesting, was focusing on high fiber led to other positive dietary choices, even though these participants weren't instructed to, you know, do this massive change to their diet, just paying attention to eating as much fiber as possible really had this snowball effect of changing um, many things in their diet in a positive way. We actually looked at this quite carefully, um, the nutrient profile of their diet at baseline to the maintenance phase when they're eating a lot of fiber, and we see increases in many vitamins and nutrients. We saw a decrease in the amount of sodium they consumed, even though we didn't say eat less salt. And we also saw a decrease in the amount of animal protein that they were consuming. So in general, these people really shifted their diet towards one that was much healthier on many fronts, um, only keeping in mind, try to eat as much dietary fiber as you can. Okay, what happened to these participants' microbiome? We found that their microbiome shifted towards one that was focused on plant degradation. So at the beginning of the study, we measured the amount of um, enzymes that are um, encoded in their microbiome to degrade complex carbohydrates. And these are just different types of these carbohydrate active enzymes. So they're responsible for degrading different types of dietary fiber. And what we see at the beginning, these are the white bars. They're actually um, quite much lower than in the maintenance phase. So we saw this increase in all these carbohydrate active enzymes when these people are consuming a lot of dietary fiber. So this is an indication that the microbiome responded to the increase in dietary fiber and is creating more of these carbohydrate active enzymes, more fermentation is happening within the gut. Um, it's just a more um, plant focused carbohydrate degrading gut than a mucus focused degrading um, gut. And so we think that this is um, a one of the beneficial effects of the high fiber diet. And we were able to see it in these participants just after six weeks of consuming this diet. We also saw improved metabolic profile in these participants. And so remember all the molecules that I showed you that the gut bacteria are producing. Some of those molecules we think are beneficial. Some are not beneficial. 
Here's an example of three of these molecules that we think are not beneficial um, that the microbes are producing. And at the baseline, they are making more of these harmful molecules than at the maintenance phase. So for these three molecules that are associated with disease, we saw a decrease in their abundance um, when they were consuming the high fiber diet. So this was an indication that the metabolism of what was happening within the microbiome in the high fiber group was actually uh, beneficial. We also measured more bacteria. So here we you know, are taking stool samples and, and basically counting how many bacteria we find in those, in those samples. And we see at baseline, um, you know, this amount of microbes um, in, their, in their stool sample. And when they're eating the high fiber diet, it actually raised significantly. So this high fiber diet is supporting more bacteria within their gut similar to what we see in these traditional populations. So we think another benefit of the high fiber diet. Okay, what about these people's immune status? We were expecting to see um, a general decrease in inflammatory markers on the high fiber diet. So we have different ways of measuring inflammation, looking at immune cell frequencies, these inflammatory cytokines, other markers of, of immune system function. And if the bar is red, that means that that marker um, increased in inflammation. And if it is blue, it, it decreased in inflammation. And we saw this sort of complex result in which participants sort of fell into three categories. This top category here, we see a lot of red. So um, it seemed like there was some potential increase in inflammation in some sort of in some of the markers. And in these bottom two groups, we saw we saw an intermediate and then a, a decrease in inflammation. And so we tried to understand why some participants did see a decrease in inflammation and others didn't. And what we found was that the participants who had the lowest inflammation during the high fiber um, intervention were the same participants that had the highest diversity of microbiota at the beginning of the experiment. So if they came into the experiment with already a fairly diverse microbiome, then the high fiber diet was actually more beneficial to them than participants that came in with a lower um, microbiota diversity at the start of the experiment. Um, so this was a very interesting result and indicates that boosting your microbiota diversity um, early on can be can allow you to gain more benefit from a high fiber diet than um, not boosting that diversity. Okay, so just to wrap up the high fiber food study, we saw improved nutrient profile of diet just by telling participants the sort of one rule of eat as much dietary fiber as you can their microbiome shifted towards plant degrading. We saw improved microbiota function and density, and we, but we did see individualized immune response, and that was related to how diverse their microbiota was at the start of the experiment. Okay, what about fermented foods? So I think, yeah, this is poll question number three um, about fermented foods. So which of the following is not a fermented food? beer, yogurt, kimchi, probiotic supplemented energy bars, and sourdough bread. Okay, wow, that was amazing. So, th so this is exactly right. Um, probiotic supplemented energy bars aren't fermented. They can they contain probiotic organisms, but that's different than fermentation. Fermentation is actually um, the transformation of a food by microbes. So, 
beer and sourdough bread are examples of foods that are fermented, but because of the baking or processing of the foods, there are no longer live microbes in there. Um, yogurt and kimchi are examples of foods that are not only fermented, but still contain living organisms um, within, the, within that food. Okay, so we, um, we know that humans and microbes have a long history together. Our world is covered in microbes and humans have consumed these microbes, had these microbes slathered all over their skin for um, the entirety of our time on this planet. And here in this picture, what I have is, this is a picture of a Hadza gentleman that's been um, hunting. He's been, he was successful in his hunt and was able to kill game. And what they do after they've killed the animal is they um, butcher it. And butchering, you know, these animals is a messy prop, uh, as a messy process. And so the way that they clean their hands is they actually open the intestinal contents of the animal that they've killed. They put their hands inside the intestine and smear that all over their hands. So actually what this guy has on his hands is the intestinal contents of the animals that, of the animal that he's killed. And this is their, you know, their way of, of washing their hands. This guy's hands is just covered in microbes. You know, this will dry off a little bit, he'll kind of brush it off, but then he will eat food with his hands. And when he's eating that food, he is consuming the microbes from this animal. This is not how Westerners wash our hands. And I don't think I could convince anybody that this is a good idea to wash your hands this way. The way that we wash our hands in the industrialized world is soap, often antibacterial soap. And so we're not covering our hands with microbes. We are removing every single microbe that we possibly can. So we have this clean, basically sterile hand that then we're used to, um, for eating. And so when we eat, we're not really eating the number of microbes that we have historically. And so, you know, nobody wants to wash their hands like this. It's not... I'm sure, you know, it's not a safe way to wash your hands. The Hadza have a high burden of infectious disease, um, which is not something that we're trying to promote. So the question is, is there a way to consume bacteria that's safe? And fermented foods might be a way to fill this gap. We know that the microbes found within fermented foods are actually quite safe for consuming. So maybe this is the way that we can expose our bodies to bacteria that, you know, in our evolutionary past came from just having a less sanitized environment. I think um, if anything that, um, that we will take away from this pandemic is our obsession with sanitizing everything is only going to get more so. Before this pandemic, we were, you know, our culture is already very aware of sanitizing thing things. And I think that this pandemic is just going to make that worse. Um, I don't think that um, anybody would say that at this moment in time, more sanitation is a bad thing. But I think we just need to think about other ways that we can incorporate good bacteria into our bodies at a time when we are removing all microbes from our environment. Um, because these sanitation efforts don't discriminate between good and bad microbes. They kill all microbes. So this is um, another clinical trial that we ran here at Stanford in collaboration with Christopher Gardner's group and the Human Immune Monitoring Corps, in which we looked at the role of fermented foods um, in these healthy adults. So we had 18 healthy adults, similar to the high fiber group. Um, we were instructed these people to slowly increase the amount of fermented foods they consumed, and then for six weeks, consume as many fermented foods as possible. And then again, this choice phase where they could pick whatever diet they wanted. We specifically told these people, don't change any other aspect of your diet. Eat all the same foods you were eating before, just add these fermented foods because we really wanted to see the role specifically of fermented foods. And then we gave them instructions on what a portion size would be for a 
for a serving. So, you know, six ounces of kombucha, yogurt, whatever they wanted to eat, um, just as much as possible. Like the high fiber group, this um, fermented food dietary intervention was quite successful. So at baseline, the average fermented food consumption was about a half serving per day. And that's pretty typical for um, Americans. And then in the you know, peak of their maintenance phase, they were consuming on average seven servings of fermented food per day. So a pretty steep incline in the amount of fermented food they consumed. People chose to eat different types of fermented foods. And we told them just, you know, whatever you like. So some people really focused on um, these gut shots, which are basically the brine of um, fermented vegetables. So like, you know, if you've ever had sauerkraut, there's like a juice associated with that. And these gut shots are just the juice that they've poured off and people have them as um, little drinks. So here's an example of a participant that just, you know, ate several servings of this um, every day. Some people really focused on fermented vegetables. A lot of people, this person just drank a bunch of kombucha. Other people focused on yogurt. So we, you know, we, all we can say from the study is the overall effect of fermented foods in general, because everybody did the intervention in their own specific way. Um, we also looked at their diet and unlike the high fiber group, uh, the fermented food group really didn't change much in their diet by um, consuming fermented food. The one thing we saw was an increase in the amount of animal protein that they were consuming. And this came from the increase in yogurt that um, these people were eating. We worried that telling people to eat a lot of fermented food would result in a huge increase in the amount of sodium that they consumed, especially fermented vegetables like kimchi, sauerkraut, these things have a lot of sodium, but we actually didn't see any difference in sodium intake during the study. So that indicated that as people were eating um, these salty fermented foods, they must have been removing sodium in other places in their diet. And so um, fear of over consuming sodium by eating a lot of fermented foods um, may not be as, as big of a worry as uh, what was previously thought. Okay, so what happened to these people's microbiota? Um, what we found was in this graph here, we have the number of different species of bacteria found within their gut and then the time course of the experiment. And so at the beginning of the experiment, people had on average around 100 different species living in their gut. By the end of the experiment, they had over like 130 different species within their gut. So they, we saw this huge increase in microbiome diversity. The amazing thing was um, this increase in diversity was cohort wide. So the entire group had an increase in microbiota diversity, regardless of the type of fermented food that they consumed. The other amazing thing that we found was that the increase in diversity actually continued in the choice phase. So these people were eating less fermented foods than they were in the maintenance phase, but still their diversity was going up. And so that was an indication that maybe you don't need seven servings of fermented foods per day. In the choice phase, they were eating more like two or three servings per day, and that might may be adequate to increase their microbiome diversity. Now, the most obvious thing you would think of when you look at this is like, well, yeah, these people are eating bacteria. Of course, you're going to find more bacteria in their gut. I mean, they're, this is what they're eating. And so we wanted to measure this increase in microbiome diversity. Is it just from the microbes that they're consuming in their food? So we went out and bought all the same foods that these participants were consuming. We grew them out on plates. Um, and found that every fermented food that we tried that has that live and active microbes label on it actually did have live and active microbes. We were able to culture microbes out of every single one of these fermented foods. So that was an indication that these were actually, you know, you can trust that part of the label. These were high quality foods. We tested what types of bacteria were found within the fermented food and largely they mirrored what was written on the label. So 
um, you know, the types of bacteria that are specified on the label of yogurt was essentially the microbes that we found within that yogurt. And so we were able to then look at how many of the new species these participants had came from the food, and it was actually less than 5%. So a very small fraction of the diversity in their microbiome actually came from the food they were consuming. The majority, 95% of this increase in diversity came from somewhere else. We don't know where, uh, but there was something about consuming fermented foods that made the microbiome receptive to increasing diversity. Maybe it's from the environment, maybe it was from other people, but consuming fermented foods allows the microbiome to harbor more species. And we don't really understand why that is the case. We have a question about the p-value in this uh, um, mm -hmm. slide. Sure. Um, since it's uh, more than uh, 005, I mean 0 0.005 is the correlation substantial they're asking. Yeah, so, you know, in this one, um, one um, time point here, we saw it was uh, over 0.05, but in these other um, groups, they were actually below 0.05. Um, and, you know, you have to remember too that because of um, how labor intensive a study like this is and the cost, this is only 18 participants. So it's, it's actually a very small um, N. And so we were actually surprised to even see this level of significance, especially given the heterogeneity and the diet that they consumed, um, the small number of participants, the fact that the intervention was on the order of um, just a couple months, not a longer period of time. So this is, um, you know, for a human study, actually quite a robust um, effect of increase in diversity. Um, for, uh, for, for a study of this type. Thank you. The other thing we were interested in looking at was um, levels of inflammation. And so here are a list of inflammatory cytokines that we were uh, monitoring. And we saw, again, cohort-wide globally, um, decreases in many of these inflammatory cytokines over the course of the study. So Unlike the fiber group that had um, different immune status changes depending on starting microbiome conditions, in the fermented food group, it didn't seem to matter what participants' starting microbiome composition was. Um, eating fermented foods led to a global decrease in inflammation. And this was sort of that two bucket thing that I was talking about where there will be strategies that apply generally more globally to improve the microbiome and the immune system um, regardless of starting microbiome state and fermented food seems to be one of those things. And there will be other things where um, the individuality of the person's microbiome is more important in understanding how things like diet or other treatments might influence uh, the microbiome and, and the immune system. So fermented foods is one of those things that seems to be broadly beneficial to um, the microbiome and um, levels of, of inflammation. Um, so for the fermented foods, we saw an increase in microbiota diversity um, and an overall decrease in inflammatory cytokines. Okay, so every time I present this, people ask, all right, well, what about probiotics? Because many of these probiotic supplements are actually just the organisms found within fermented foods. And so, you know, lots of people are like, I just don't want to eat fermented foods. I don't like the taste. I just too much of a pain. Can't I just take a probiotic supplement? Isn't that going to provide the same effect? And so we wanted to test that directly. Um, in this study, we um, actually wanted to raise the bar a little bit. And instead of looking at healthy participants, we wanted to look at participants that had metabolic syndrome to see if probiotics could not only influence the microbiome and immune system, but perhaps even influence um, uh, markers of metabolic syndrome. And so here we had 28 
participants with um, metabolic syndrome that were assigned to the probiotic cohort, and then 14 participants that received um, a placebo. Instead, it's a sort of similar to the prior studies in that we have four weeks of baseline uh, prior to the intervention where we're collecting samples, a 10 week um, intervention, and then a washout. And we're measuring um, stool and blood to look at uh, the microbiome and immune system. And basically asking the questions, can probiotics improve the microbiome? Can they, um, like we saw in the fermented foods, can they decrease inflammation and can they reduce the severity of metabolic syndrome? Okay, unlike the uh, fermented food study, the probiotics did not result in a general increase in microbiota diversity. In fact, in the probiotic group, um, at, from baseline to the very beginning of the study, when they first start taking the probiotics, we saw a decrease in microbiota diversity. Um, this is some indication that the probiotic is having an effect on the microbiota. It, the microbiota is sensing that there's these microbes coming in. Um, but, um, you know, as the study continues on, these people maintain the same diversity um, as, the, as their baseline samples. So um, this is a different result than what we saw in the fermented food group. We looked at the same inflammatory cytokines that were reduced in the um, fermented food cohort and did not see an effect of the probiotic intervention on inflammatory cytokine levels. So no change between placebo and probiotic and no change over the course of the experiment. Um, then we looked at um, markers of their um, metabolic syndrome. So cholesterol, triglycerides, insulin, these kinds of things. In general, we saw no effect, but when we looked at individualized analysis, um, so here is the placebo group here, um, each person is a um, row, and then each metric is a column. If it's um, light blue, it doesn't change, dark blue, it goes down, and then red, it goes up. Um, and what we found was within the probiotic cohort, um, the data separated into two groups. So there was a group that seemed to um, not have any response to the probiotic, but then we did see a group in which they had a statistically significant decrease in their triglycerides um, and better insulin functioning. And so we termed this group responders and um, tried to understand what it was about these participants that allowed them to um, benefit from the probiotic intervention. And when we, we looked at starting microbiota composition, that didn't matter. Other microbiome measurements didn't seem to matter. The thing that we did find was um, diet appeared to differentiate the responders and non-responders. And more specifically, the responders had higher intake of many of these vitamins and um, nutrients. Um, higher intake of total carbohydrates. And so um, the nutritionist that we were working with on this study, when we showed her these data, she was like, oh, well, the, this is just a marker of a better overall quality diet. So it appeared that the responders were eating um, just in general, a healthier diet than the non-responders. And when we looked more carefully at their dietary uh, recall, we found that in general, the responders were eating more plants um, than the non-responders were. Um, and so what I hope that you can take away from this talk is that um, not all microbes are bad. Uh, we're living in an environment right now where I feel like microbes are getting an even worse reputation maybe than they already had. Um, but we have to remember that there are in fact many good microbes. And if we, um, we need to, as we increase the amount of sanitation around us, figure out ways that we can expose ourselves to good microbes um, in a safe way. And it appears that fermented foods might be um, a good strategy to expose yourself to beneficial microbes 
in a safe way without risking exposing yourself to a pathogenic microbes. So fermented foods could compensate for our sanitized environment. We know that fermented foods um, in this small study improved the microbiome and immune system um, and that probiotics may be most beneficial in the context of a healthy diet. Um, again, these studies are small. We have a small number of participants, but we are using these pilot studies in order to um, generate hypotheses that we can test in mouse models and also do larger cohort studies. So because we saw a difference in how people's microbiome and immune um, responded to the high fiber versus the high fermented food cohort, um, we think that blending these two dietary components, high fiber foods and high fermented foods, may actually provide the greatest benefit because they are doing different things. And we're currently um, organizing a study in order to test whether eating both high fiber and for high fermented food might have a synergistic effect on improving the microbiome and immune status of the host. So here I just have some ideas for blending fiber and fermented foods um, like yogurt with nuts and berries, kimchi fried rice, um, green smoothies that have kefir in them. Just thinking of different ways that we can um, increase our dietary fiber and increase our exposure to beneficial microbes. Um, I wanted to give you guys just because a lot of times I give this talk and people are like, okay, well, this is great. These are very, but these are very generalized recommendations. Like what are specific things that I can do? And so I wanted to show you guys the instructions that we gave to the participants in the high fiber diet of specific ways that you can increase um, fiber to your diet. And so these were all suggestions that we gave to participants that would add five grams of dietary fiber per day to your diet. And if you look at these things, like they're actually fairly simple ways to um, increase dietary fiber. Um, you know, adding beans, legumes are, have amazing amounts of dietary fiber. So if you have, uh, if beans are something that you eat quite commonly, um, then you, you're probably eating more fiber than the average American does. Things like trading chips for popcorn, um, adding nuts and berries to your diet, trading white um, carbs like white rice for things like barley or wild rice can also improve um, fiber consumption. Um, this, these were the instructions that we gave to the, um, or some of the instructions that we gave to the fermented food participants. So you can see examples of um, adding fermented foods. This would give you, this example diet would give you six servings of fermented foods a day, which is a lot. And um, I would not recommend going from a typical half serving of fermented foods per day to like six servings the very next day. That might be a little bit too much for your gut to, um, to take all at once. So um, I think it's and we found this with our participants that ramping up slowly both in fiber and fermented foods was, a, was an important aspect of that study to allow participants microbiome and gut to adjust to this new diet um, in a way that was as easy as possible. Um, if you're interested in learning more about fermented foods, there are some great books out there. I know a lot of people have instant pots and may not realize that there's a yogurt function on there. I've been making um, yogurt using my instant pot, which has been um, a lot of fun. And then here's a fermentation crock with pickles going in here and then um, starter grains for kefir. I wanted to show you some of the fermenting projects that we've been doing at home. Um, my husband is also a professor at Stanford in microbiology. So um, both of us working from home are missing culturing microbes in the lab since um, being microbiologists, we both love microbes. And so we've been culturing microbes at home instead. Here is um, some kombucha that we're culturing right now. This is a batch of kimchi and some sauerkraut that we have going. And these are like little airlocks that you can buy and put on top of mason jars to create fermentation vessels. And these are just, you know, if people are home anyway, kind of fun projects to um, culture microbes and get some very delicious fermented foods. Here, if you're a little bit more adventurous, we, we decided to try um, 
fermenting barley using koji and koji is um is a microbe that is used in uh, making things like um miso or soy sauce um and it's uh here we're fermenting some barley and you can i'm not sure if you can see well in this picture there's all this like fuzz growing that's the fermented um barley grains these are the microbes growing on top okay so finally i want to end with um the one of the major challenges that i think we're facing um i gave this talk i showed you the data on um, improvements that we saw on a high fiber and high fermented food diet the detriment of eating a sanitized low fiber diet. And so I think like many people, when faced with that data, it's easy to say, okay, that's, I'm convinced I'm gonna change my diet. It's clear that the Western industrialized diet has problems with it. And I'm gonna eat a high fiber, high fermented food diet. And if we can just have Erica give this talk to everybody on the planet, then you know Western disease burden is gonna go way down because everybody's gonna eat a healthier diet. The problem is that um, we are wired for caloric density. So um, when our Hadza study was published, it was, um, they chose to feature it on the cover of science and they used as their cover image, this picture of a Hadza man holding a honeycomb. One of the major foods that the Hadza consume is honey. Um, for this man to obtain this honey, what he had to do was um, start a fire by rubbing two sticks together. Um, he carries this fire up a tree. Most of these hives are high up in trees. So they have um, sticks that they've basically hammered in, pegs that they've hammered into the tree. So this guy can climb up um, holding his stick of fire. He gets to the where the hive is, um, sticks the smoky stick into the hive to smoke the bees out, um, and then reaches in there with his bare hands to pull out honeycomb and then throws it down to his buddy. During this time, he's um, getting stung by these bees. And in fact, you, if you see his finger here, it's quite swollen. He's been stung. Um, and this is one of the way that Hadza die. They climb up these trees really high and then they get attacked by these bees and fall out of the tree and, um, and die. And so for this man to obtain this honey, he um, essentially risked his life. And so if every time we wanted a sweet snack, like a frappuccino or a cupcake, we had to risk our lives we would eat way less of those foods. But because we live in an environment where these sweet fatty foods not only don't risk our lives, they are plentiful and relatively inexpensive, we are over consuming those foods. And so if you brought this Hadza guy to um, you know, the Bay Area, he would be making all the bad food choices that we make. The Hadza eat a high fiber diet, not because they love tubers. And in fact, if you ask them what their favorite food is, it's honey and meat. If you ask them what their least favorite food is, it's the tubers. They hate those tubers, but that is the food that they don't have to risk their life for and that they don't, um, th that is plentiful and they can always count on. So they are eating a high fiber diet, not out of choice, but that is the food that's available. And over our evolutionary past as a species, that is the environment that we lived in. One in which high fiber foods were plentiful and easy to get and an environment where high sugar, high fat foods, we had to risk our lives for. And so our brain is set up to crave these high fiber, high, or sorry, high sugar, high fat foods. Um, and because we, these things are easy to get, we are over consuming them. So how do we make good food choices in an environment that is full of easy to get convenience foods? Um, education and research is likely part of that. Policy changes that make these unhealthy foods um, more difficult to get. Uh, food technology. So maybe there are ways of making these foods that we are, you know, craving 
higher fiber or consuming um, or including microbes in them, making them healthier. Or maybe there are some simple hacks we can do. So one example of a hack that um, a lot of people talk about is just not bringing foods into the house that you don't wanna consume. So one thing that our family does is um, we, my family really likes to eat ice cream. I have two teenage daughters that love ice cream. And I, I make it a rule not to purchase ice cream at the grocery store because I know if I have it in my freezer after dinner, we're going to eat it. And so I don't have it in my freezer, but let's say after dinner, our family decides like, oh, having ice cream sounds really good. Um, that would involve getting into the car at that point after dinner and going and getting ice cream. Many nights were like, it's just not worth it it's too much work. We're just not going to have, we'll just have a piece of fruit instead. Some nights we're like, no, we really want ice cream. We're going to go to Baskin Robbins and get it. But it's a way of adding a barrier, much like how the Hadza have a barrier for getting honey, finding ways that makes it more difficult to get these um, low nutrient quality foods um, might be a way that we can improve our diet. Okay, final poll question. Maybe before that poll, there are two questions I can sure. ask. <laughs> Should I? So one question is, uh, do, is there any plan to conduct um, trials? Uh, like, because you mentioned, you know, the population of these trial and N is too small. Is uh, they're asking if there is a plan uh, to conduct trials of larger than 100? Mm -hmm to increase participants number and uh, for longer year, like um, one year to get benefit uh, from the data you're collecting. Yes, we are um, currently trying to secure funding for a much larger study where we would do um, similar to the fiber fermented food individually um, and also have participants consume both high fiber and high fermented foods um, at the same time. Um, much larger cohort. The, the fermented food, um, because that intervention was so short and yet we still saw a response, we don't um, think the study would have to be too much longer, but um, it would be interesting, you know, if we can get participants that are willing to do these kinds of diets for a year, which is, you know, not so easy. One, one thing I'll say, the high fiber group, when we talked to them about the study, they all said um, they felt much better on the high fiber diet. They really enjoyed um, how they felt on the diet, but that that high fiber diet was really difficult to maintain because it involved a lot more cooking. They said if they would eat out at a restaurant, it would be really hard to maintain a high level of dietary fiber. And so, um, you know, getting people to eat these kinds of diets for an extended period of time might be tricky, but it could be that, you know, these people for the high fiber group doubled their amount of dietary fiber intake. And the question is, if you only increased it, say 50%, but did a much longer study, um, would you see the same effect? So um, we're we're definitely very interested in doing larger studies, trying these different um, tactics of, um, you know, longer time, maybe, less of an intervention or, or adding the two components to see how that would, um, how that would influence their microbiome and immune system. Thank you. The other question is how does fasting impact uh, gut microbiome population? Yeah, there, you know, there haven't been a lot of really good studies on that. So I, I really, it's a question that we get a lot and I know fasting is something that's like very popular right now. Um, but unfortunately we, re we just don't, we don't really know um, how, how fasting influences the microbiome. You know, in the short term, it, because you don't have complex carbohydrates coming through from food, my guess is there would be some consumption of the mucus lining. But, you know, depending on the fasting strategy, like some of this intermittent fasting is maybe not long enough for that to happen. But it's really an, an open question that we don't know. Thank you. Okay, so now the polling. Okay, which of the following statements is not true? Humans are a composite organism made of humans and microbial cells. 
unlike our human genome, our microbiome is a malleable part of our associated genetic material that is sensitive to our diet and lifestyle. All bacteria are bad for us and we should try to eliminate them at all cost. And the modern industrial lifestyle has changed our microbiome towards one that may promote chronic diseases. Okay, yeah, the majority of you got it right. All bacteria are bad and we should try to eliminate them. So hopefully that means that um, I did a good job explaining this and that you have a better understanding of the microbiome than before. Okay, finally, I just wanna end with acknowledging the members of our lab. This is um, a collaborative effort, not only within the Sonnenberg lab, but also within um, Stanford with our close association with the Gardner Group that helps with the uh, dietary interventions and the clinical trials and the Human Immune Monitoring Corps at Stanford uh, run by Mark Davis that helps us understand um, the human immune system as we do these dietary interventions. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, or comments that people have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh... Thank you. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, it was wonderful presentation, wonderful talk, and a lot of information, new information. Um, you mentioned Dr. Gardner's. Um, we actually have Christopher Gardner. Uh, so for all the participants, uh, we have Christopher Gardner um, speak at our science series in February. So February 1st, please uh, stay tuned for the um, registration. Uh, he's going to talk about the science of nutrition. Um, February 1st uh, from 9 to 11 uh, in our science series next year. So um, one question came in, uh, can you comment on the influence of formula instead of the breastfeeding uh, for our microbiome? Yeah, so that's um, something that our lab has worked on. So an interesting thing about um, breast milk, which people may not realize, is one of the most abundant components of breast milk is this molecule called human milk oligosaccharides or HMO. And this is a complex carbohydrate that for a long time was kind of confusing because it is so abundant in human milk, but yet it's clear that our human genome can't degrade this complex carbohydrate. And so why would a mother put so much effort into synthesizing a carbohydrate that her baby can't digest? Well, it turns out this complex carbohydrate is actually well digested by the um, infant's growing microbiome. So the human milk oligosaccharides are actually meant to be food to the baby's bacteria, um, not the baby's cells specifically. And so in a way, human milk is kind of the original high fiber diet because it has a lot of these complex carbohydrates that um, promote a healthy microbiome. For the formula industry has begun to understand that their um, product is quite inferior and in that it doesn't have human milk oligosaccharides. And it's called human milk oligosaccharides because it is human specific. There's no other source of these complex carbohydrates. So formula manufacturers have tried adding other types of complex carbohydrates. So you might see in formula, um, sometimes they say, you know, now with added GOS or FOS, which are uh, galacto oligosaccharides and fructose oligosaccharides. These are complex carbohydrates that are degraded by gut bacteria. Um, and so it's an attempt to try to recreate the sort of high fiber part of, of um, human milk. But these GOS and FOS are not um, the same as the human milk oligosaccharides. And so it doesn't promote the same type of 
microbial community that human milk would. And when we see infants that are formula fed versus breastfed, um, there's a quite striking difference in their microbiome composition. Now, after these infants are weaned onto solid food, um, that difference disappears. So if I look at a, a five-year-old microbiome, I cannot tell if that child was infant formula fed or breastfed. So whatever changes um, happen, it, it, they disappear um, when they're on solid food. Now that doesn't mean that we don't think that that early microbiome composition is not important. We know that much of the immune education um, of humans happens early on in life. And so it's possible that the rise that we see um, increase in incidence of autoimmune diseases, allergies, these types of things that are, that are higher in infants that ha or in, in people that were formula fed could be a result of the immune system not being um, subjected to the proper microbiome because of formula feeding. So the formula industry is aware of this. They are trying to um, increase the amount of complex carbohydrates, make them more like human milk oligosaccharides, and they are moving forward in that. Um, but it is, they, so far they still have not been able to perfectly mimic um, human milk oligosaccharides. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Kudo is coming in to Dr. Sonnenberg. Great talk. Very, very useful. Where to go for microbiome typing? I think that's a, yeah. And then, yeah. Um, uh, so there, you know, there are a lot of companies. Or, sorry, there are a lot of companies out there that you can mail in a stool sample and they'll tell you, you know, what microbes are in your gut. I would say um, if you are, just interested in knowing the type of bacteria that are in your gut, that's a great way to figure those things out. If you're interested in changing your diet or changing something and you want like a before and after, um, I would say that those companies, um, you know, figuring out what your microbiota looks like at those time points might be interesting. The, the issue that I have with some of those companies is that you will send in a sample, they'll send you what your microbiome looks like, and then they will give you very specific recommendations on the foods you shouldn't, should and shouldn't consume. And from what I have seen, that's not really evidence-based. I'm not really sure what their, um, what information they're using to, to provide those recommendations. Right now, there's no way that I know of that I can look at someone's microbiome and say, oh, you shouldn't eat carrots. Instead, you should be eating celery or, or these very specific recommendations. So um, the one thing about those companies is that I, I feel like sometimes they can be a little far out in front of what the science is right now. Wonderful, thank you. Another question is, uh, do, um, sorry, I missed uh, the, um, okay. Do or can fiber supplements help feed the gut microbiota or is fiber from food the best uh, form of fiber for the microbiota? Yeah, that's a great question and actually something that we're also studying. So another clinical trial that I ha didn't talk to you about that we're running right now is specifically looking at prebiotics or fiber supplements. Um, we're just wrapping up that trial now in the next uh, couple weeks. And so we don't have data on that yet, um, but we're very interested to know, you know, is it, can you just take the fiber supplement and is that going to get you most of the way there. I mean, those fiber supplements aren't going to contain the other helpful components of high fiber foods, the vitamins and minerals that we saw go up in those participants on the high fiber diet. And um, what we saw in the fermented food is when participants just tried eating the or consuming the probiotic, we didn't see the same effect. Um, my guess is that the fiber supplement is not going to be as good as the high fiber food, but um, Let's see what the study tells us and what we can learn. It could be that the high fiber supplements is actually, you know, better than nothing and maybe almost just as good as the, the high fiber foods. Thank you. And the same uh, question on the uh, microbiome typing, uh, is there any facility you recommend? You know, I, I think this is still happening, but at one point um, UCSD had a, 
I think it's called the American Gut Project. Um, and that's a facility where you could, you know, mail in samples and, you know, they don't provide recommendations. They do, you know, tell you what's in your gut. They compare it to traditional populations. And the nice thing about the American Gut Project is they make all that data publicly available for microbiome scientists. I've actually used that data um, in some of our Hadza work to try to compare traditional populations and Americans. And so um, it's a great way to contribute to, um, you know, a, a big citizen science project. So if American Gut Project is still going, I would say um, go with those guys. And the nice thing about going with them is they use the same pipeline of analysis as other, as all microbiome scientists. So the data is more comparable to um, other studies that will come out in the future. Wonderful, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. We are uh, on time and uh, just for the participants, please note this uh, science theory is eligible for um, BRN or continuous